So I'd like to introduce author and Googler Alex Martelli, and he will be ta telling us all about Python design patterns. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Actually, I'll be uh, telling you about half or two or one third of it, depending, because this is just the first part of a talk that will need to be split into two or three parts, depending on some issues. So uh, let's say that every, for every argument, we can roughly classify how much we already understand about it, how much study and practice we have to level hardly heard about it, haven't even heard about it, or just barely. Uh, level zero, uh, journeyman, sorry, apprentice. Apprentice is like, I've started, don't really know much yet, but I'm starting started. Uh, journeyman or master. So how many of you would say about Python, I hardly heard about it? Okay. Um, how many consider yourselves apprentices? How many journeymen? Mm -hmm. How many masters of Python? OK. Now, same question about design patterns. I've hardly heard about them. Uh, apprentice, just getting started. OK. Um, journeyman, mastering pretty well. Master, could teach about those things. OK. So, we have just about the right level of audience. I think we can split it in two uh, by compressing about three hours of materials into two hours worth of presentation. Uh, this is roughly how this is uh, structured. The Shuhari traditional levels more or less correspond to um, apprentice, journeyman, master, although there are other implications there. I aim for pretty low to medium level for design patterns, um, not really giving any absolutely revolutionary insight there. And somewhat higher than that about Python, I don't really teach any of the basics. Uh, I may give some insight. Uh, but roughly, this is the number of slides I have on each subject. For total, I haven't really counted, it's about 90. Uh, so we'll try to cover about half of it that is basically all the way to structural patterns this time, and in the second part, focus on behavioral patterns. Q&A, besides the end of the talk, are welcome any time, but of course, I may be just about to answer uh, whatever question you're thinking of uh, in uh, the next slide or so, so please uh, try to wait a second before asking, just to see if I, I'm already going to answer it. So, patterns, what's patterns? Uh, you know, if, unless you're, hardly ever about it, that uh, the very concept was born about 30 years ago in the works of uh, architect and philosopher Christopher Alexander, it's basically thinking about buildings and towns, places where people live and work. Uh, they're made of entities he decided to call patterns. Uh, and by looking at things in terms of languages of patterns interacting with each other, the different details can be subsumed in a grander view. Uh, he also has this much more, uh, for his, from his third book, uh, A Pattern Language, very verbose but very important quote, every pattern describes a problem, which occurs often, and the core of the solution to that problem in such a style that if we really understand and apply it, we can apply the same solution without ever doing things the same way twice. Uh, that is the essence of patterns in the most general sense possible. Um, a crucial issue which Alexander stresses only a thousand times in his books uh, and his followers, uh, maybe 500, another 500 in the software books, uh, is that design is not independent of technology. Patterns are not a design concept in the sense of being independent from the technology to be chosen in implementation. If you're going to build in bricks or wood or concrete, some things remain the same, but many important things changes. You don't exactly use the same patterns. Similarly, to quote uh, Gametal from the foundational book of uh, design patterns as a software discipline, point of view affects one interpretation of what counts as a pattern, and choice of programming language is important because it changes the point of view. That's why I titled this talk Design Pattern for Python, because I'm specifically addressing this point of view in my talk. Um, more generally, 
design patterns are thrive particularly in within object oriented development for no particular reason i mean they could apply just as well to assembly level programming or or functional programming but i guess uh, object oriented is the mainstream nowadays uh, mostly thanks to that wonderful book which i was holding a second ago and to that incredible sequence of conferences and proceedings and online debate and constructive criticism that is a pattern language of programming series slash community. Um, they were so hyped and they're such a nice name that three or four years ago I was starting to get really worried that they'd be swept away as a fad or fashion as so many other good and not so good ideas in software have been. Uh, because people are always looking for a silver bullet. Well, not us, we know there isn't one, but uh, a lot of other people. Um, and fortunately, the concept has matured, and I think we're past the danger of being swept away by hype. Uh, and I keep repeating, they're not independent from programming languages. So what are the traditional design patterns applied to software? Well, they're not something like data structures or algorithms. Uh, on the simple end, so a linked list or a quick sort is not a design pattern. They're not even um, domain specific architecture for entire subsystems, something that's too big and, and, and abstract. So, for example, um, HTTP sessions built on top of cookies, that's not a design pattern. That's too specific of uh, uh, the field of. Uh, um, building, uh, session, building sessions on top of a uh, non-session oriented protocol. Um, so somewhere in the middle, between the low level things uh, and, and the domain specific uh, more complicated things, uh, uh, that's where we have the patterns. Uh, uh, to quote the Gang of Four again, descriptions of communicating objects and classes, that's because we are in the or, or domain, we would say communicating functions and higher order functions if we were talking about functional programming, customized to solve a general design problem in a particular context. Uh, sometimes we're talking mostly about classes, but far more often we're talking about how the objects relate. And uh, the purpose of the pattern is a very generic description or category. Uh, what is this pattern all about? Uh, and you're supposed to do a very formal write-up of a design pattern. Um, I'm focusing on two really important aspects. The name of the pattern is absolutely crucial because if you don't name things, they don't stay well in your memory. And the known uses, which I will be quoting at every step and uh, also referred to as uh, KUs, um, are absolutely crucial. If you cannot quote at least three examples from disparate pieces of software, it's not a design pattern. Uh, that's absolutely crucial in both Alexander's conception and the Gangs of Four. You don't invent a design pattern. You discover it in nature, so to speak. You discover it in the state of the art of practitioners in the field. And then there's all sort of uh, formalized uh, uh, terminology such as forces, which forces meaning uh, constraints and desires, uh, this pattern solves and so on. Um, but the complete schema is hardly ever appropriate. It depends on what audience. If you want to go present at PLOP, then by all means do a completely formal write-up. But if you're talking about uh, the typical in front of the whiteboard design discussion with colleagues, uh, then something more simple, a little bit more of course than just the name and no users, but uh, say the results and rationale or uh, context and problem are, are reasonably important. But you don't use, need to use a whole complex approach. So there's plenty of books which I would recommend depending on exactly what you're going to. Uh, most importantly, I would not, repeat, not recommend the original book to anybody except people at re level. If you already know all there is to know about design patterns, that is the time to read this book. It's definitely not an introductory. I would not recommend uh, pattern hatching to anybody except those who have already read throughout design patterns, critiqued it, and have particularly and are able to argue convincingly as to why this is right but that was wrong. 
uh, because this is basically what Lucida does here. I would not recommend this one to anybody who's already married because it could put your marriage in danger, in danger but it is, although, otherwise it's quite a cool book, very funny as, as you can expect. Seriously, the uh, best introductor, introductory books uh, are essentially those two. Uh, Shalloway and Trot for very formal uh, classroom-like and um, head first uh, for, if you like, thinking visually and, and uh, with a bit of disorder very creatively. Um, this is extremely, this is Bob Martin, extremely recommended because he, the only really good book that merges design patterns as in what comes out of your design with uh, methodologies, what goes into your design, how, how do you proceed with that. Um, and a few others. Uh, this is, of course, strictly if you are in a C++ shop where you are actually allowed to use all of C++, otherwise you'll feel very frustrated. Okay, um, so as Albert Brown and Wolf in one of the books I recommend have already pointed out extremely clearly, I'm just summarizing their arguments, uh, uh, many classic design patterns are workaround for the existence of static typing. So they wrote the small talk, small talk companion, about half of the gang of four were very strong small talk programmers, but they basically took their small talk hats off when they wrote the book and accepted static typing as a way of life. It need not be so, it's not in small talk, it's not in Python, it's not in many other languages. So basically forget all the static typing constraints if you're going to program in small talk or Python. Um, and vice versa, there are specific strengths of the languages you're using with, such as d dynamic abilities, introspection, and so on, which you may really want to capitalize on. And I keep focusing on names as important, which is why I keep using the classic names even when things appear very different in Python. Some patterns simply disappear because they get incorporated into standard libraries and, uh, and languages. Typical example is iterator. Modern languages have iterator built in or in the standard library. So the iterator pattern, which covers uh, quite an important role in the original book, absolutely has no reason to exist as a pattern any more than you would consider it a pattern uh, subroutine call. If you were programming binary machine code knowing there is a pattern called subroutine call whereby you push the return address somewhere before you jump to somewhere else would be crucial, but your language offers calling to subroutine as a built-in feature of the language. It's not a pattern anymore. Same goes for iterator. So the categories of purpose of DPs uh, in the traditional uh, framing, which I'm strictly following, would be creational, structural, behavioral. The creational ones are the ones uh, concerned with instantiation of objects. The structural one deal with mutual composition of classes and objects. You can imagine something that exists in a certain way. And the behavioral one um, deal with the interaction. Of course, there's a few creational patterns, a bit more structural one in an enormous sea of behavioral ones because the number of different important interactions uh, is much higher than the number of possible structural relationship, which in turn uh, swamps the number of uh, creational things. So I hope to cover today some of uh, the patterns in these first two and leave the behavioral stuff for the second part. Uh, something that holds no matter where, no matter what language, no matter what else, as long as you're doing object-oriented so, uh, design patterns at least, uh, two f absolutely crucial ideas which pervade the book, pervade the design pattern thinking, program to an interface, not to an implementation. This is also a great idea to do if you're doing machine code, uh, not just in object-oriented programming. How careful you have to do, you have to be to do that, depends on your language as well. Uh, in Python, it's generally automatic. Unless you take real trouble to do things wrong, you are doing things right. You are. Uh, implicitly using duct typing, which is the extreme form of programming to an interface. Uh, in other languages, you have to be a bit more careful about it, not all that much. And favor object composition over class inheritance. So when object-oriented programming was first introduced, inheritance was basically seen as essentially synonym with object-oriented programming. You had to do everything by inheritance. It took decades, I would say, to basically find out all the ways in which this is not a good idea and wean ourselves, collectively speaking, from overuse of inheritance. 
in favor of more flexible mechanisms for composition. I still remember the first time I, I read a book on C++ style which taught me it's wrong to inherit um, car from engine. Why? It's so handy. Yes, well, a car is not an engine. A car has an engine and so on and so forth. Uh, that was over 20 years ago, but uh, it's taken the industry collectively almost as much. But most of us still probably tend to inherit too much unless we sit and think about it because inheritance is so handy and the costs are not obvious until you have uh, progressed a bit with your design. Um, so inherit only when it's convenient. I know that's kind of more of a pragmatic, I know they, Party line is supposed to be inherit only when you can assert a list of uh, uh, invariance and um, is A. Well, I think you cannot ever assert is A. Um, I think uh, as uh, uh, Korzybski put it, the is of identity is the most uh, widespread error in thinking and perceiving the world. Uh, so you can never assert is if you want to be really fanatic about it, at least not if you're into Korzybski, Wittgenstein and others of my favorite thinkers. Uh, on the other hand, checking that it's really convenient, yes, you want to expose all methods that are in the base. You want to do a lot of reuse, a little override, uh, and maybe extend a little bit. Uh, and you are perfectly fine with being so tightly coupled with the class you're inheriting from that you will never untangle the coupling. Then if all of this holds, then it's right. Otherwise, go for hold or wrap. Um, hold and wrap, in the case of Python, are a subtle distinction. Um, I insist on doing it like this kids are holding the Python, as you can see, uh, which is much safer than having the Python wrapped around you. Uh, but um, that depends on how big is the Python. This one is particularly large. Uh, so by hold, I mean an object as a certain sub-object as an attribute, and everybody, including the object itself and external client, know that, and call o.s. some method. It's simple, it's direct, it's immediate. The problem is the coupling is very strong and it's all wrong. Uh, you're exposing the detail that O is implemented by, by having an S and what method S needs to have to all and sundry. Uh, the wrapping is a hold by private name or most often by private name and the delegation. So everybody else calls O.method as opposed to O.S.method. Um, you can do that explicitly, like in every language, by defining method to call self as method, or you can do it automatically with, with get after. We'll see a few examples later because it's such a common Python idiom. Uh, the point is you get the coupling right. Um, read up on the load the meter is not particularly Python specific, but it's a very uh, sim super simplified um, guideline to good object oriented design. Uh, never have more than one dot. If you're saying o.s.method, you have two dots and you know something is wrong. Now, that's, it is oversimplified, but it's a handy rule of thumb. So, this is an example of wrapping, uh, with being much more appropriate than inheritance because inheritance cannot restrict. The, if you inherit, you first of all, among other things, commit to exposing every single method and public attribute of your base class. So what if you want to do all but a few? Well, you can do that by wrapping to restrict. So this is an initialization which takes something to wrap and a set of things of names to block and records it. And then whenever you try to get any attribute on this object with a certain name, if the, na the name is among the blocked ones, then a an attribute error is raised. You claim it's not there. Otherwise, you delegate to the wrapped object. Incidentally, if the wrapped object itself doesn't have this attribute either, they will raise, they will raise uh, the attribute error. We just propagate it. That's perfectly fine. So this isn't exactly a pattern, but it's a typical example id of idiomatic use of getatter in Python. Um, OK, creational patterns. Uh, they don't really play all that much of a role in Python, although, yes. I have decorator later, and I wouldn't 
really claim it is because it's removing something as opposed to adding something. Decorator normally adds something. This removes something. So yeah, I guess it's very, very close to decorator, but I deal with it here because of the removal aspects. So <coughs> it's important to have thought a little bit about creational patterns, even though they don't really play that much of a role in Python. Uh, I've always wondered, why don't they? Why are they so crucial in other languages? Well, I would guess it is mostly because, as we'll see, uh, the factory concept is essentially built in Python. You don't have to do something different to call a generic factory function versus instantiating a specific class. So it comes very handy. But being aware of it is not a bad idea anyway. So I'm dealing with two subcategories of creational patterns. One is we want just one instance to exist. Uh, the note, I, this, in this case, I start by stating the problem rather than any solution because or problem or context or forces we're solving, we only want one instance of something to exist. Normally in object-oriented programming, you make a class and then instantiate it as many times as needed. Sometimes you think, right or wrong, that you only want it instantiated once, rarely exactly three times or something like that. So let's stick with once. The solution for about 99% of the cases in Python is don't use a class, use a module. The main thing about class is being able to instantiate in them repeatedly, just use a module and that module will have intrinsically just one instance. If, you, if that module gets imported from several places, as you know, Python internally makes sure only one instance of the module is used. Um, there are some problems with that. Uh, modules don't support subclassing, so you can't really do any tweak. Modules don't support special methods, so you can't use, uh, for example, arithmetic operators. You can do plus, uh, times, uh, divide by, which are sometimes nice to have. Uh, second approach is just make one instance. You only want one instance? Well, make one instance and use it. That's it. Why do you need to enforce the existence of just one instance? It, this works for another 99% of the case is not covered by the first 99%. The only real issue with it is that you have to commit to the time when that instance is made because all the rest of your software needs to be able to know there is an instance around and know what name to access it from or which means to access it from. And then there's a the classic singleton pattern which I call Highlander for reasons I hope are obvious. Uh, the problem with Singleton is uh, that despite the claims in, in uh, the Gang of Four book, it really doesn't work with subclassing very well at all. It will, we'll discuss that. Essentially, well, we'll, we'll see it when, when you come to the Python code, but it applies any language. And then there's monostate. Monostate is the name originally given to it in the, I think it was in the C++ user journal, uh, but I called it Borg. And the one problem with it is that Guido hates it for reasons he's never really explained to me. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I didn't connect. So the, there can be only one is, of course, uh, the Highlander reference in, in this thing, which is much better than Singleton, the 20 bridge player means a suit in which I only have one card. And it's very handy for doing roughs, but it's not. Nothing to do with object-oriented programming. Uh, so Python has this uh, special method new, which is essentially th they play so where theoretically new instances of the class get constructed, and this thing guarantees it only constructs a new instance once and then keeps returning it. Why do I claim that subclassing is a problem? Well, suppose there's a class foo that inherits from singleton and class bar that inherits from foo. Now I instantiate foo, and then I instantiate bar. What now? Do I still have one instance of singleton? Uh, which class is it? Or do I suddenly have two? It uh, depends on, in this case, I, I made it per class, but this means there's more than one instance of singleton. There is more than one completely disjoint object on which a test of is instance will say, yes, it is an instance. The, alternatively, you can forbid that. You, ha you can have this fail, but then you are not supporting subclassing. There is really no way to support subclassing well in singleton. That's the, one of the big reasons singleton is totally bankrupt. And although it's most uh, popular design pattern, you can uh, do some 
quick Google trends to find out the names of various design pattern, it never works in any language. Uh, because there is a concept means you can always subclass something. There's no, well, at least in C++, no way to say this class is not subclassable further. But then uh, instances of the subclass are instances of the mother class, and that kind of breaks everything. Once again, the, the quote, um, so Borg is basically forget about instances, who care about instances, as long as they all share the same state, they may as well be one and you're very happy. There is absolutely no case in which this gives any problem. So in the in monostate, you do that as in, in C++, the original version, you do that by forcing every method to be static, every data uh, member to be static. That unfortunately doesn't really support inheritance either. Uh, so that Robert Martin has a very nice critique of uh, monostate and singleton in an essay on his site, uh, Object Mentor. Uh, but in, in Python you have reasonable control over the object state. So basically you can set the dictionary where the object holds all of its state to the shared state of a class. And so you can make as many objects as you want, they will all be the same, except in terms of identity, in terms of everything, they will share the same state. Any modification, any access will always go to the same state. And when you want to subclass, you just have in one, at one level of the subclasses to assert that this, and of course all descendants until otherwise claimed, share, have the same shared state. So basically you're doing data overriding, which is a typical Python feature, not common to all object-oriented language, whereby a class can override. So you see, as long as you access it this way, the shared state is not a static issue of this class Borg, but an issue of whatever class is being generated. This is the equivalent of what uh, Smalltalk calls, calls a class method. Python also has class method. So the other and much more interesting uh, uh, issue of creation on patterns is that we don't want to commit uh, throughout our code to instantiating specific classes. This is absolutely crucial because uh, they, this is where the program to an interface and not to an implementation most often breaks down in the real world. People do strive hard to program to the interface and now they need a new widget and they do call new widget or, uh, well, I think it's new widget in both Java and C++. And there, in that very spot, they have destroyed their independence from the actual implementation because they're instantiating a specific class. So this is why this whole group of creational patterns is so important because you absolutely need to uproot that from your code. There are, are essentially two approaches, one, which I will not deal in depth, but is very well covered in, uh, on Engedu, is dependency injection, which basically mean your object never create other objects. They always get whatever they need injected from the outside. This is extremely wonderful for testing purposes. And it does help a lot avoiding the uh, specific class problem. Uh, the problem with dependency injection per se, it doesn't cover you, okay, you don't know how many widgets you'll need. Part of your object's work is to determine that and generate five or seven or 22 widgets, and you don't really know how many. How do you inject those dependencies into the object in the first place? You don't, you inject a factory. That is, a factory is uh, something that can, some callable, some function, more, for example, that can create new objects of whatever class is appropriate, the factory knows, or can reuse old ones if needed. Um, they can be methods, overridable by subclasses. They can be functions or other callables. And you can have an abstract factory class that basically is a collection of methods uh, for creation of factory methods consistent with each other. So in Python, each and every type and class is essentially a factory. Because you call it, it's a callable like any other. You call it like you would call anything else. And this is the most crucial thing that makes it interchangeable with any other 
callable, which could be a function or whatever else. Um, internally, it may implement that new met special method we mentioned, which means it can actually do anything. It can do anything in terms of instantiation. It doesn't actually have to give out new instances. And it may be injected directly. Since classes are objects, so there's no need to have a boilerplate function to call the class, just pass the class as an argument, and, and there you are. It can be injected. Modules also uh, can be kind of ab abstract factory in a non OO way. For example, uh, you never import POSIX or import NT. I, I've never seen it in Python code anywhere. You import OS, and OS is the module which knows or finds out, okay, am I on a POSIX operating system or an NT operating system? and basically subsumes and generates a single instance of one or the other as needed. The, it not, you cannot inherit and further refine the idea, which is why classes are more flexible, but sometimes you don't, you don't really want, at least in, in design terms, we don't really want to have different implementations of the operating system interface module depending on which variant of Windows NT we are on or which variant of Unix systems we're on. Although it might be a better idea, this isn't the way it was designed in the first place. So this is the only known news I'm going to give for any creation pattern in Python, and it's not really in the library, which kind of underscores the fact that uh, it's not all that used. Um, whenever you call a type, Intrinsically, it basically starts with a new method, and if the new method actually returns an instance of the class it's been asked for, then that instance gets initialized. So <coughs> Python intrinsically um, does a uh, two-phase construction, which is a pattern not in the book, but uh, very popular in other realms, uh, particularly in, in GUIs you often have. You don't really want to initialize uh, the window object as soon as it's created because you first need to establish, connect it in various and different ways, and then all the initialization must take place. So two-phase construction is uh, the constructor proper does hardly anything, and then all the hard work is done in a separate initialization method. It's very popular in many realms, and Python basically embodies it internally this way. This is an example of a very highly generically factory function, one which is able to load any object from any package in reach. You give it the name of the package and the name of the object, and it does everything else, of course. It would be easy to design it with a single argument, which is the dot separated name, and does the split on the last dot. But I just, since the role of the package name and the object name are different, I decided. This uses a built-in import function which basically given a package, a couple of dictionaries to hold context and possibly a list of object names that will be needed, returns the, the module from the package and then get attribute can take in particular the name object from. So for example, you can dynamically load, of course, this doesn't make any sense because it's absolutely equivalent to from P1, P2, P3 import C4 as CLS, so there's a language construct for that. But by using this function, you can get these strings from all sort of places and do dark magic, which is probably not the best idea to do in production code, but can be very handy for testing as usual. All right, so this just about covers my extremely short coverage of creational patterns. Uh, this could be a great idea for questions because I'm not going to talk about Creational patterns ever again. Oh, okay. Then we'll move on to structural patterns. I'm actually only dealing with one subcategory in this series of talks for now, uh, which I call masquerading and adaption. I mostly do that because finding a nice uh, uh, side picture for structure is almost impossible, while for mask you can find pretty cool ones. This is my main motivation. Uh, no, really. Um, these five patterns, adapter, facade, bridge, decorator, and proxy, have something in common. They're all about uh, objects that basically take the place of another or make believe they are another. Like, okay, that's a bit vague, but uh, let's go on case by case. 
So adapter tweaks an interface at either class or object level. You need to consider both variants. Facade simplifies a subsystems interface. Bridge allows you to use many implementations of an abstract uh, of an abstraction, so build many implementations of an abstraction using many different implementations of a certain functionality without having to repetitively coding. Decorator re reuses and tweaks without inheritance and proxy decouples access um, to, to an object functionality from where the object is, uh, whether you're allowed to reach for it and so on. So, adapter. We have some client code gamma that requires a protocol C. Protocol is my favorite generic uh, equivalent of interface. I, I see interface as something that's purely syntactical, while protocol implies pragmatic constraints as well. Um, supplier code sigma provides some different protocol S, which basically has all that C needs, but in different, uh, arranged in different ways. So I write some adapter code that sneaks in the middle between uh, the client and the supplier. It looks like a supplier to the client, it looks like a client to the supplier, and implements protocol C by making calls to, to protocol S. So let's have a toy example. Uh, very, very toy. What we require is a method foo bar that take, takes a foo and a bar. Unfortunately, what we are given is a method bar foo that takes a bar and a foo. So how do we reduce the impedance mismatch with an adapter? For example, let's uh, stick to object-oriented. We have a class with, whose method bar foo takes a bar and a foo. And our client code is, is called to, to use a different library where the classes uh, had a method foo bar which wanted a foo and a bar. This is how we do it with wrapping delegation. So we write the wrapper, which takes the wrapper and saves it. And whenever you call foo bar with foo and bar, it delegates that to bar foo on the wrapper with bar and foo. It's not rocket science, but it's the tiniest and yet useful example of adapter that I could put together. And this is how you instantiate it. You pass the existing bar foo as part of the instantiation. If you want to work at a class level, you can do it with inheritance. So basically, you delegate to yourself. So a foo bar, in this case, inherits from a bar foo and adds method foo bar, which calls bar foo. This isn't necessarily appropriate because you also, you also end up with a original bar foo. So this is maybe faster. But uh, it, the other approach, the per-object approach, is definitely cleaner. There are many known uses of adapter in the um, Python standard library. Oh, I forgot to mention that all my known users are from the Python standard library. Uh, it's a large library. You can find examples. It, it's pretty representative of, uh, of good Python code. For example, uh, a socket can be seen as a file object. It has an underlying file object. Uh, um, ad adapter, which basically wraps uh, the raw functionality of socket into the rich interface of file objects. Uh, that's a case of an adapter that actually has to do a lot of work because sockets are unbuffered and files are buffered. So all the buffering functionality is hidden there. I don't think that's very appropriate. I would have liked to have a buffering class outside reused there, but that's how we coded it. Um, don't know if you're familiar with the doc test, which are very handy, fast, quick to write, but not quite as proper and nice as the unit test. But if you have a lot of doc tests, you can adapt them into unit tests with this test suite adapter. Uh, dbhash is another example of adapter. Python standard library includes uh, the, um, an interface to the Berkeley standard distribution database, which is an extremely rich and complicated system. Sometimes we want to access it just if it was a good old DBM kind of file from the early days of Unis. dbhash gives us that. Or stringio, you have, if you have a string and want to access it as if it was a file, you don't have to write it on disk, which would be silly. You wrapped it in a stringio. Shelv basically takes something that has a very limited subset of dictionaries, 
uh, essentially forcing string keys and values and offering just the very basic method and make it look just like a rich dictionary uh, because it uses pickle so it can translate any object to a string and back uh, and user, user did mix in to add all the other dictionary functionality. So from these known uses and some other looking at real world code, we see that in real life uh, some adapters require a lot of code, not a bit more than the foobar barfu example I gave, which is why I identified as a toy example. Mixing classes are absolutely a great way to adapt to rich protocols. You can implement advanced methods, nice, easy things. Uh, I would exempt uh, uh, mixing classes from my general dislike of inheritance. I think mixing classes are the greatest thing since sliced bread. Adapters occurs on a level of complexity. I can actually imagine, although I don't remember a specific case, where I would code an adapter as simple as a bar foo to foo bar, uh, and def that's like, you can't really get any simpler than that, and on the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, you really do use it after for such things as DB hash and, and BSD DB. And it's not just about classes and their instances. In particular, we'll see that after facade, but callables are, are a very good target for that. So a facade occurs when some supplier code, a rich subsystem ideally, uh, provides uh, a lot of complexity, a lot of complex and rich functionality, and we need a simple subset. Uh, not necessarily because we've already written to that simple subset, just be because we don't want like a bazillion other users of our code to have to code to this complicated thing when they only need one-tenth of the functionality. So basically, the facade code is, the fa implements and supply the simple sub subset C, uh, by making internally its goals to S as needed. Uh, so what's the difference between a facade and adapter? It's kind of subtle. Um, adapter is about supplying a given protocol required by client code. So you imagine yourself already having a client, so the protocol you need is fixed. Uh, or you are designing the, the client protocol to be uh, homogeneous so you can use polymorphism. Uh, facade, on the other hand, is about having this very rich interface that does a bazillion things when you know only a few is needed and you want to present them in a very simple to use way. Uh, and most often, although this will not come very <laughs> clearly across from the known users because I haven't found any, but in real life, facade typically fronts for many objects, for a complex system full of stuff while adapter is typically a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Uh, so the best way to present facade I've found is in this site, which is extremely controversial. If you like controversy about design patterns and PHP and MySQL, uh, you will find them aplenty here. Uh, this is the concept. This is how it would be without facade. So I have my subsystem with a lot of classes, and everybody from the outside is needing to make calls to many classes. Uh, with a facade, I take a little extra step, so basically everybody calls the facade, and the facade deals with the complexity of the, of the subsystem. So I don't use many figures here apart from s silly ornamentation, but I really like this one because it shows you the advantage. Basically here, not, you're making the life of every client class very complicated because they need to learn about all sort of important internal details of your subsystem and you're making your future life hell because you will be constrained forever to keep this complex interface around because everybody's making calls on your insights. Uh, if you do go to the trouble of offering a facade, the lives of the clients are simpler because all the things they need are concentrated in one simplified place. And your life is simpler because the, the moment you decide to redo this completely, you only need to make sure you can keep emulating the facade and your maintenance is much easier. This is far more than the simpler adapter provides. Unfortunately, the known users don't really support that. I have not found any real complicated subsystem with a facade. Well, email has a bit of that. The email package is pretty rich inside, uh, but the reason the, for, for the thinking of the facade is actually to emulate a, an older legacy implementation of email sending, so it's not really the best of examples. Uh, 
the facades I found are basically simplifying adapters of single objects, which is not exactly the best idea. For example, in Modula SynChat, there's a type FIFO, which facades for list. It just gives you push and pop functionality on top of list rich functionality. You could see DB hash as facading for BSDDB. This is probably the closest we actually get to a facade. I also gave it as an example of an adapter, so I'm cheating, but uh, uh, old sets. Now sets are built in, but they used to be a facade on top of dicks. Uh, Cubes do a lot of stuff, but one way of framing them is a facade for a double-ended cube with a lock because they're thread safe. Um, Auspath has some facades too. So in real life, facade may have substantial amounts of code. The important thing is to simplify the interface, even if that means you do have to add a bit more code. Uh, in sometimes minor functional additions like handed methods. It occurs at a level of complexity, but it really matters when you're really dealing with complicated subsystem, otherwise it's kind of gratuitous. Uh, and inheritance is never useful. Since you're simplifying, you're restricting, and since you're restricting, inheritance is useless. Inheritance always widens interfaces, never restricts them. And this is an example of um, both adapting and facading also works for call callables, not just uh, um, in object-oriented cases in Python. Um, callables play a very large role in Python programming uh, because you can easily pass them as arguments, return them as results. Uh, so you often need to adapt or facade them. Uh, so there's functional partial, which uh, performs currying operations. So the most uh, elementary kind of simplification you can do on a callable is fix some of the arguments and, and functional partials let you do that. And you have decorator syntax, they add something to make it as easy as can be to apply a higher order function to wrap an existing callable. Uh, closures, uh, uh, nest, lexically nested functions provide for, with extreme directness for the simple needs you may have in terms of Restricting, and of course, you can always write a class with a special method call. Uh, this is, by the way, is from an economic fundamentals text. It explains how to compute the worth of callables com compared to standard loan. Well, callables means load, um, loans that can be repaid in advance with no penalty. So, bridge. Uh, you have a lot of realizations raw of a certain abstraction A. Each of them could be using any of several implementation yota of functionality f, and you don't want to code n1 times n2 boilerplate classes. So what you do is make sure the abstract superclass of all the abstractions holds a reference to the abstract super interface of all the possible implementation, and each row has to go through r to reach f. That's the easiest way I have to this is a toy example in that it uh, only, I wouldn't do it this way, but it's one way to do a bridge. Uh, so say we have an abstract parser and all the abstract parser does is accept a scanner object and hold it and then what, oh sorry, I skipped, the, you need two underscores here, I typo on my part. Uh, Every time it stands for any attribute, it, it asks the scanner for that attribute. So that is essentially the same idiom I was using earlier for, except it doesn't do any addition nor any subtraction either, so it's even simpler. But the point is that um, the, any, any parser can uh, subclass abstract parser and whenever, say, it needs the next token or needs to push back a token on a pushback stack, it doesn't have to worry about uh, what scanner approach as long as the interfaces are, are closed. It basically calls them, in this case, on self. It, I, I've used, uh, that's because I've used this idiom. It could be self, if I hadn't this get at her, I would say self.scanner.next token, self.scanner.pushback. So basically, they all get funneled there. Um, so there's several known uses, such as uh, socket servers, one of the most complex. Uh, we end with a decorator, decorator crab in particular, uh, which basically is how to insert some semantic tweak. Basically, it's kind of like an adapter, except that the incoming and outgoing interfaces are identical. 
and this is kind of a complex uh, subject for 10 minutes left. Uh, I would point out zip file, which basically looks like a file and wraps a file, but inserts dynamically and transparently compression and decompression in the middle. Uh, recursive locks, which look just like lock, but know um, who is holding them and, uh, and allow the same thread that already holds them to acquire them again. Uh, codex, which basically transform a byte stream to a byte stream, but with some typically internationalization into post. And this is the Hubsucker proxy, by the way, uh, is uh, for access restriction, object to live remotely or in persisted forms. Uh, uh, we have uh, like weak ref proxy has to do with lifetime issue, which is a typical use for proxy. We want to be able to access some object as long as it exists, but not keep it alive just for our purposes, for example, for caching. That's why weak refs exist. Uh, shelf, which I already gave as another example, also does proxying. Uh, Idle lib remote debugger is a typical example. It lets you insert debugging into a remote process uh, by essentially by proxying for it. Ah, and this is part one. And we do have seven minutes left for questions and answers. So I hope there are some. Otherwise, I rushed through the last part unwarrantedly. I was kind of hoping I could uh, cut this in two parts rather than three, which is why I inserted the pause here. Any question? Yes. Um, I gave the URL at the very start, but let me do that again. HTTP www.aliax.it slash gu underscore pydp.pdf. And that is just one uh, big PDF. It covers both the part we've done today and the part we'll do sometime in the future. We haven't set a date yet. Boris. Alex, you gave great examples from the Python library. Do you have any good examples from the oh, Sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. So uh, you gave great examples from the Python libraries. Have any good examples, you know, like from Google Code? Actually, uh, yes. Now that I think of it, maybe we should. Of the talk. Maybe, yeah, we should leave this for. I do have an uh, excellent example from third-party libraries and applications. Uh, for example, one important class of design patterns which I haven't covered at all are design patterns for asynchronous communication. They're covered very well for C++. Uh, in a couple of books by Dr. Schmidt, and they're incorporated inside the Python library in a very s simplified way known as async or async chat. Uh, there's a third party package called Twisted, which is basically the best implementation I've ever seen of those patterns, uh, bar none, in, that includes uh, ACE, which is a great uh, library, but uh, Twisted is better. So there's plenty of third party libraries. Uh, you could look at uh, important applications. I've never really studied there, but I'm pretty sure you can find a lot of, like, take Sugar, the interface of the one laptop per child. It's all in Python. I'm pretty sure they're using a lot of uh, design patterns in an interesting way. It would be a great thing to do a report on that. Or big applications written in Python, such as Mailman, uh, Chandler, Django. There's so many of them that are open source, so you don't have to have strained access. Other questions? So you've talked a lot about uh, Python-specific design patterns. I was curious as to whether you thought that there are any, I mean, you, have, you talked more about general, excuse me, you talked more about general design patterns. Mm -hmm. And I was curious as to whether you think there are any that, are, that you've discussed today that are more relevant in Python than in other languages. I mean, you talked a little bit about some of that. I less. try to focus my discussion only on those aspects which are relevant to Python, yes. Right, but, but all of the design patterns that you've talked about, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. could be applied to, to... They all come from the... Right, exactly. In and the second part, I will uh, uh, get into one design pattern in extreme depth. This part has been more of a survey. The second part will be mostly about uh, not just behavioral patterns in general, but three of them, 
uh, template method, state, and strategy, and I really get into the issue of uh, how introspection and dynamic uh, approaches uh, serve there. Most of them, so I'm not talking about patterns that only apply to Python. I'm not very interested in that. It, besides, uh, there are languages which are basically equivalent in power, such as Ruby. It's pretty, would be pretty weird to have something that only applies to Python and not to Ruby or vice versa, because it would have to be some weird syntactic peculiarity. Oh, iterators are different, but mm. the iterator pattern doesn't apply to either languages because they both have iterators built in in different ways. Uh, small talk uh, like in the case of Ruby and uh, uh, much more similar to the Genga 4 design pattern in case of Python. But in either case, they're built into the language, so that's not so much a design pattern anymore in those cases. Right. I had a question that I, I noticed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a question that I noticed in your um, talk when you were working on um, one of the patterns where you were wrapping an object. Mm -hmm. Holding and it occurred to me that you were wrapping the object uh, in such a way that someone that was looking into the object wouldn't see those methods as part of the interface. Uh, you uh, mean for introspection purposes? Right. Absolutely. And I was wondering, is that a danger that a language like Python has that you never run into in C++? And, and I wonder if you could comment on what we need to do to uh, consider that well, in Python. You, um, you well, uh, you could run it into in C++ you were, if you were doing debugging. You would have, you, in debugging with some advanced debugger, including a class browser, so you get this object which is actually proxying. And you may not uh, actually be able to tell what it does have. Or if you're using dynamic cast or other advanced uh, aspects of C++, uh, uh, your debugger, depending how smart your debugger is, it may get rather confused. Uh, if you specifically want to support interactive debugging, you basically have to add all the introspection to your wrapper to make sure it looks to the outside, including a debugger, exactly as it would look in the inside. It's a lot of overhead if, unless you're specifically very interested in interacting debugging. As you know, I go by the, by the motto, uh, debugging sucks, testing rocks. So, so I'm much more interested in supporting uh, extended testing than uh, in supporting extended debugging. When I am debugging something, I'm going to be aware of the, of, of the actual issues anyway. So for example, suppose I'm debugging something and I have problems on a proxy that actually is supposed to send the calls out to Australia. Uh, I'd better know that because the reason things are misbehaving may have nothing to do with my code and everything to do with the an underground cable through the Pacific Ocean having just been cut by an earthquake. So trying to have proxies and other such consoles be totally transparent is possibly a misguided uh, expense of labor given these issues, particularly in case of, okay, it doesn't work, now what? Well, is there actually a transatlantic cable in the middle? You can't really abstract from that because it could get cut from an earthquake. All right, I think we're out of time, actually. So okay, thank you very, very much. much.